Pyramus and Thisbe A Greek Folk Story Retold by Josephine Preston Peabody This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Venus did not always befriend true lovers, as she had befriended Hippomenes with her three golden apples. Sometimes in the chanted island of Cyprus she forgot her worshippers far away, and they called on her in vain. So it was in the sad story of Hero and Leander, who lived on opposite borders of the Hellespont. Hero dwelt at Sestos, where she served as a priestess in the very temple of Venus, and Leander's home was in Ilbidos, a town on the opposite shore. But every night the slover would swim across the water to see Hero, guided by the light which she was wont to set in her tower. Even such loyalty could not conquer fate. There came a great storm one night that put out the beacon and washed Leander's body up with the waves to Hero, and she sprang into the water to rejoin him, and so perished. Not wholly unlike this was the fate of Halcyon, a queen of Thessaly, who dreamed that her husband Ceyx had been drowned, and on waking hastened to the shore to look for him. There she saw her dream come true, his lifeless body floating towards her on the tide, and as she flung herself after him, mad with grief, the air upheld her, and she seemed to fly. Husband and wife were changed into birds, and there on the very water, at certain seasons, they build a nest that floats unhurt, a portent of calm for many days and safe voyage for the ships. So it is that seamen love these birds and look for halcyon weather. But there once lived in Babylonia two lovers named Pyramus and Thisbe, who were parted by a strange mischance for they lived in adjoining houses, and although their parents had forbidden them to marry, these two had found a means of talking together through a crevice in the wall. Here, again and again, Pyramus on his side of the wall, and Thisbe on hers, they would meet to tell each other all that had happened during the day, and to complain of their cruel parents. At length they decided that they would endure it no longer, but that they would leave their homes and be married come what might. They planned to meet, on a certain evening, by a mulberry tree near the tomb of King Ninus, outside the city gates. Once safely met, they were resolved to brave fortune together. So far all went well. At the appointed time, Thisbe, heavily veiled, managed to escape from home unnoticed, and after a stealthy journey through the streets of Babylon, she came to the grove of mulberries near the tomb of Ninus. The place was deserted, and once there she put off the veil from her face to see if Pyramus waited anywhere among the shadows. She heard the sound of a footfall, and turned to behold, not Pyramus, but a creature unwelcome to any tryst, none other than a lioness crouching to drink from the pool hard by. Without a cry, Thisbe fled, dropping her veil as she ran. She found a hiding place among the rocks at some distance, and there she waited, not knowing what else to do. The lioness, having quenched her thirst, after some ferocious meal, turned from the spring and, coming upon the veil, sniffed at it curiously, tore and tossed it with her reddened jaws, as she would have done with Thisbe herself, then dropped the plaything and crept away to the forest once more. It was but a little after this that Pyramus came hurrying to the meeting place, breathless with eager to find Thisbe and to tell her what had delayed him. He found no Thisbe there. For a moment he was confounded. Then he looked about for some sign of her, some footprint by the pool. There was a trail of a wild beast in the grass, and nearby a woman's veil, torn and stained with blood. He caught it up and knew it for Thisbe's. So she had come at the appointed hour, true to her word. She had waited there for him, alone and defenseless, and she had fallen a prey to some beast from the jungle. As these thoughts rushed upon the young man's mind, he could endure no more. "'Was it to meet me, Thisbe, that you came to such death?' cried he. "'And I followed all too late, but I will atone. Even now I come lagging, but by no will of mine.' So saying, the poor youth drew his sword and fell upon it. 
there at the foot of the mulberry tree which he had named as the trysting place and his life-blood ran about the roots during these very moments thisbe hearing no sound and a little reassured had stolen from her hiding-place and was come to the edge of the grove she saw that the lioness had left the spring and eager to show her lover that she had dared all things to keep faith she came slowly little by little back to the mulberry tree she found pyramus there according to his promise his own sword was in his heart the empty scabbard by his side and in his hand he held her veil still clasped thisbe saw these things as in a dream and suddenly the truth awoke her she saw the piteous mischance of all and when the dying pyramus opened his eyes and fixed them upon her her heart broke with the same sword she stabbed herself and the lovers died together there the parents found them after a weary search and they were buried together in the same tomb but the berries of the mulberry tree turned red that day and red they have remained ever since end of pyramus and thisbe greek folk stories retold by josephine preston peabody Read by Ginger Cucolo. Fun and Nonsense by Willard Bonte. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction Fun and Nonsense are a pair of merry little twins, and when they come to visit us, they bring their friends the grins. They're coming now to visit you. This page we'll call the door. To open wide, just turn the leaf. Why, we have met before. The Barber Said Chocolate Drop the Barber, Why, bless my ugly soul, I'll ask that stick of peppermint to be my barber pole. The Refusal Dear sweet lady cracker, my passions you know, and I scorn them, Judge Wafer, as you're lacking in dough. A hopeless case. What is the use, quoth the whitewash brush? I'll comb my hair no more, for try as I will to make it lie, it still stays pompadour. The Greenhorn. A lettuce walking out one day lost his head, so lost his way. A pumpkin happened on the scene and said it came from being green. Old Mr. Match Old Mr. Match gave his head a good scratch, and his face lighted up with a smile. It is getting quite dark, but with my cheery spark I will lengthen the day for a while. Thoughts Unstrung Alas, I fear my mind doth wander, and o'er this narrative I ponder, I usually know what I have read, but this time I have lost the thread. The Miser The pocket-book has money, on that subject he is daft. But when one strikes him for a loan, he answers, I am strapped. Dr. Key's Answer Shine, inquired the monkey wrench, of stately Dr. Key, no, replied that haughty soul, no monkey shines for me. The Chase Mr. Brush, on his steed, dashing with speed, was asked if he had time to spare, said he with a smile, I'll be back in a while, but at present I'm hunting the hare. A Rising Doctor Dr. Yeastcake, it's hard for me to speak, as I haven't risen for more than a week. Take this, Mr. Roll, and never you fear. You'll rise before morning, so be of good cheer. The Sailor Bold Pilot von Pretzel's a crusty old salt who wears a rich shade of tan, which he did not acquire at sea, by the way, but in a warm baking pan. Overheard in the cornfield Said young Mr. Pumpkin to old Mr. Squash, Do you think Mr. Corn overhears what we say when we talk of his self-conscious stalk? and his moving Miss Mellon to tears? I cannot decide, Mr. Squash then replied, but I've had my suspicions for years, 
because he's so tall he can lean over all, then look at the size of his ears. Twins There go the scissor twins, cutting as ever. Some think them sharp, but few think them clever. A sharp lover I dread you much, my little miss. You're such a dainty thing. I fear, although quite sharp myself, you've got me on the string. The greedy little pitchers. Now, my pretty little dears, little pitchers have big ears, but never let me hear it said that your mouths are big instead. Obliging Mr. Hammer. Old Mr. Hammer was so very, very good that he gave Mr. Shingle-Nail a drive through the wood. The Malicious Brush When poor little hand-glass was loudly berated for casting reflections, the brush was elated. The Wise Pen There was a pen in our town, and he was wondrous wise. He knew just when to cross his T's and when to dot his I's. But one small thing he did not know, a simple thing at that, he did not know twas nice to wipe his feet off on the mat. In of Fun and Nonsense by Willard Bonte, read by Phil Chenevere. The Blue Jar by Maria Edgeworth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Rosamond, a little girl about seven years of age, was walking with her mother in the streets of London. As she passed along, she looked in at the windows of several shops and saw a great variety of different sorts of things, of which she did not know the use or even the names. She wished to stop to look at them, but there was a great number of people in the streets, and a great many carts, carriages, and wheelbarrows, and she was afraid to let go of her mother's hand. Oh, mother, how happy I should be, she said, as she passed the toy shop, if I had all these pretty things. What, all? Do you wish for them all, Rosamond? Yes, mother, all. As she spoke, they came to a milliner's shop, the windows of which were decorated with ribbons and lace and festoons of artificial flowers. Oh, mother, what beautiful roses. Won't you buy some of them? No, my dear. Why? Because I don't want them, my dear. They went a little farther and came to another shop, which caught Rosamond's eye. It was a jeweler's shop, and in it were a great many pretty baubles, ranged in drawers behind glass. Mother, will you buy some of these? Which of them, Rosamond? Which? I don't know which. Any of them will do, for they are all pretty. Yes, they are all pretty, but of what use would they be to me? Use? Well, I'm sure you could find some use or other for them if you would only buy them first. But I would rather find out the use first. Well, then, mother, there are buckles. You know that buckles are useful things, very useful things. I have a pair of buckles. I don't want another pair, said her mother, and walked on. Rosamond was very sorry that her mother wanted nothing. Presently, however, they came to a shop which appeared to her far more beautiful than the rest. It was a chemist's shop, but she did not know that. Oh, mother, oh, cried she, pulling her mother's hand. Look, look, blue, green, red, yellow, and purple. Oh, mother, what beautiful things. Won't you buy some of these? Still her mother answered as before. Of what use would they be to me, Rosamond? You might put flowers in them, mother, and they would look so pretty on the chimney piece. I wish I had one of them. You have a flower pot, said her mother, and that is not a flower pot. But I could use it for a flower pot, mother, you know. Perhaps if you were to see it nearer, if you were to examine it, you might be disappointed. No, indeed, I'm sure I should not. I should like it exceedingly. Rosamond kept her head turned to look at the blue vase until she could see it no longer. Then, mother, said she after a pause, perhaps you have no money. Yes, I have. Dear me, if I had money, I would buy roses and boxes and buckles and blue flower pots and everything. Rosamond was obliged to pause in the midst of her speech. Oh, mother, would you stop a minute for me? I have got a stone in my shoe. It hurts me very much. How comes there to be a stone in your shoe? Because of this great hole, mother, it comes in there. My shoes are quite worn out. I wish you would be so very good as to give me another pair. Nay, Rosamond, but I have not money enough to buy shoes and flower pots and buckles and boxes and everything. Rosamond thought that was a great pity, but now her foot, which had been hurt by the stone, 
began to give her so much pain that she was obliged to hop every other step, and she could think of nothing else. They came to a shoemaker's shop soon afterwards. There, there, mother, there are shoes. There are little shoes that would just fit me, and you know shoes would be really of use to me. Yes, so they would, Rosamond. Come in. She followed her mother into the shop. Mr. Sewell, the shoemaker, had a great many customers, and his shop was full, so they were obliged to wait. Well, Rosamond said her mother, you don't think the shop so pretty as the rest? No, not nearly. It is black and dark, and there are nothing but shoes all round, and besides, there's a very disagreeable smell. That smell is the smell of new leather. Is it? Oh, said Rosamond, looking round, there is a pair of little shoes. They'll just fit me, I'm sure. Perhaps they might. But you cannot be sure till you have tried them on, any more than you can be quite sure that you should like the blue boss exceedingly till you have examined it more attentively. Why, I don't know about the shoes, certainly, till I have tried. But, mother, I am quite sure I should like the flower pot. Well, which would you rather have, that jar or a pair of shoes? I will buy either for you. Dear mother, thank you, but if you could buy both? No, not both. Then the jar, if you please. But I should tell you that in that case I shall not give you another pair of shoes this month. This month? That's a very long time indeed. You can't think how these hurt me. I believe I'd better have any shoes. Yet that blue flower pot. Oh, indeed, mother, these shoes are not so very, very bad. I think I might wear them a little longer, and the month will soon be over. I can make them last till the end of the month, can't I? Don't you think so, mother? Nay, my dear, I want you to think for yourself. You will have time enough to consider the matter whilst I speak to Mr. Sewell about my clogs. Mr. Sewell was by this time at leisure, and whilst her mother was speaking to him, Rosamond stood in profound meditation, with one shoe on and the other in her hand. Well, my dear, have you decided? Mother, yes, I believe I have. If you please, I should like to have the flower pot. That is, if you won't think me very silly, mother. Why, as to that, I can't promise you, Rosamond. But when you have to judge for yourself, you should choose what will make you happy, and then it would not signify who thought you silly. Then, mother, if that's all, I am sure the flower pot would make me happy, said she, putting on her old shoe again. So I choose the flower pot. Very well, you shall have it. Clasp your shoe and come home. Rosamond clasped her shoe and ran after her mother. It was not long before the shoe came down at the heel, and many times she was obliged to stop to take the stones out of it, and she often limped with pain. But still, the thoughts of the blue flower pot prevailed, and she persisted in her choice. When they came to the shop with the large window, Rosamond felt much pleasure upon hearing her mother desire the servant, who was with them, to buy the blue jar and bring it home. He had other commissions, so he did not return with them. Rosamond, as soon as she got in, ran to gather all her own flowers, which she kept in a corner of her mother's garden. I'm afraid they'll be dead before the flower pot comes, Rosamond, said her mother to her, as she came in with the flowers in her lap. No, indeed, mother, it will come home very soon, I dare say. I shall be very happy putting them into the blue flower pot. I hope so, my dear. The servant was much longer returning home than Rosamond had expected, but at length he came, and brought with him the long-wished-for jar. The moment it was set down upon the table, Rosamond ran up to it with an exclamation of joy. I may have it now, mother? Yes, my dear, it is yours. Rosamond poured the flowers from her lap upon the carpet and seized the blue flower pot. Oh, dear, mother, cried she, as soon as she had taken off the top, but there's something dark in it which smells very disagreeably. What is it? I didn't want this black stuff. Nor I, my dear. But what shall I do with it, mother? That I cannot tell. It will be of no use to me, mother. That I cannot help. But I must pour it out and fill the flower pot with water. As you please, my dear. Will you lend me a bowl to pour it into, mother? That was more than I promised you, my dear, but I will lend you a bowl. The bowl was produced, and Rosamond proceeded to empty the blue vase. But she experienced much surprise and disappointment on finding, when it was entirely empty, that it was no longer a blue vase. It was a plain white glass jar, which had appeared to have that beautiful color merely from the liquor with which it had been filled. Little Rosamond burst into tears. Why should you cry, my dear? said her mother. It will be of as much use to you now as ever for a flower pot. But it won't look so pretty on the chimney piece. I am sure if I had known that it was not really blue, I should not have wished to have it so much. But didn't I tell you that you had not examined it, and that perhaps you would be disappointed? And so I am disappointed indeed. I wish I had believed you at once. Now I had much rather have the shoes, for I shall not be able to walk all this month. 
even walking home that little way hurt me exceedingly mother i will give you the flower pot back again and that blue stuff and all if you'll only give me the shoes no rosamond you must abide by your own choice and now the best thing you can possibly do is to bear your disappointment with good humour i will bear it as well as i can said rosamond wiping her eyes and she began slowly and sorrowfully to fill the pots of flowers but rosamond's disappointment did not end here many were the difficulties and distresses into which her imprudent choice brought her before the end of the month every day her shoes grew worse and worse so at last she could neither run dance jump nor walk in them whenever rosamond was called to see anything she was detained pulling her shoes up at the heels and was sure to be too late whenever her mother was going out to walk she could not take rosamond with her for rosamond had no soles to her shoes and at length on the very last day of the month it happened that her father proposed to take her with her brother to a glass house which she had long wished to see she was very happy for when she was quite ready had her hat and gloves on and was making haste downstairs to her brother and father who were waiting for her at the hall door the shoe dropped off she put it on again in a great hurry but as she was going across the hall her father turned round why are you walking slipshod no one must walk slipshod with me why rosamond said he looking at her shoes with disgust i thought that you were always neat go i cannot take you with me rosamond coloured and retired oh mother said she as she took off her hat how i wish i had chosen the shoes they would have been of so much more use to me than the jar however i am sure no not, not quite sure but i hope i shall be wiser another time End of The Blue Jar by Maria Edgeworth The Naughty Puppies by Author Unknown This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Heather Hamptel The Naughty Puppies There were two little puppy dogs, Tiny named and Toodles, who got into all kinds of scrapes like little foolish noodles tiny was a brownish dog and toodles was a white one and tiny had a cunning eye and toodles had a bright one tiny played all kinds of tricks for which his parents chide him and toodles did poor foolish pup whatever tiny bid him come toodles tiny said one day it's bright and pleasant weather we'll go and fight the turkey cock and off they went together but all their courage oozed away when the turkey cock said gobble they both turned tail and scampered off as fast as they could toddle but turkey caught them up at last and read them both a lecture and how he served them with his beak i'll leave you to conjecture so home they went with drooping tails and pace so lame and jerky and said next time we'll tease the hens and leave alone the turkey the visits to the poultry yard of tiny and of toodles soon brought on their papa a call of master cockadoodles he said my hens can't lay an egg though once i had a case full because your puppies frightened them it's wicked it's disgraceful but let them venture once again my hens to chase and worry and all receive them in a way shall make them sad and sorry toddles heard this and crept away and in the straw lay quiet but tiny yelled till the cock marched off disgusted with the riot from bad to worse went these naughty pups it's almost past believing but yet i assure you tis a fact that now they took to thieving they soon fell into bad company and certain unprincipled poodles and idle mongrels and bobtailed curs were the consorts of tiny and toodles they let these bad dogs into the house where a pot of milk was standing in quest of which they scampered upstairs as far as the first floor landing but betty the cook was scrubbing the stairs with a mop and a pail of water and tiny ran off with his head in the pot while the rest yelled out for quarter now little miss jane had a persian cat whose fur was soft and silky whose tail was long and whose eyes were blue and whose color was white and milky this was a quiet good-natured cat and master tiny knew it he said i'll frighten her out of her wits just watch me toodles i'll do it so he ran at puss 
with a yelp and a snap as fast as he was able across the paddock and through the yard and over the fence by the stable but puss turned suddenly scratched his nose and set him yelling and weeping and tiny owned with a rueful face that he wished he'd left her sleeping punishment follows folks who play tricks although they hope to keep clear of it the puppy's bad conduct was told papa who was mightily grieved to hear of it for papa was a grave respectable dog faithful and full of affection and the farmyard was safe from robbers by night under his steady protection so he said to cure you of pranks like these i condemn each little sinner to stand and look on for three whole days while i eat up his dinner and to show you i mean to mend your ways by every means in my power you shall both learn how doth the busy bee improve each shining hour end of recording this recording is in the public domain death and burial of poor cock robin by h l stevens this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org who killed cock robin i said the sparrow with my bow and arrow i killed cock robin who saw him die i said the fly with my little eye i saw him die who caught his blood i said the fish with my little dish i caught his blood who'll make his shroud i said the beetle with my thread and needle i'll make his shroud who'll dig his grave i said the owl with my spade and trowel i'll dig his grave who'll bear the pall we said the wren both the cock and the hen we'll bear the pall who'll carry him to the grave i said the kite if it's not in the night i'll carry him to the grave who'll be the parson i said the rook with my little book i'll be the parson who'll sing the psalm i said the thrush as he sat in the bush i'll sing a psalm who'll be the clerk i said the lark if it's not in the dark i'll be the clerk who'll be chief mourner i said the dove because i mourned for my love i'll be chief mourner who'll carry the link i said the linnet i'll fetch it in a minute i'll carry the link who'll toll the bell i said the bull because i can pull i'll toll the bell all the birds in the air fell to sighing and sobbing when they heard the bell for poor cock robin while the cruel cock sparrow the cause of their grief was hung on a gibbet next day like a thief end of death and burial of poor cock robin by h l stevens the tale of two bad mice by beatrix porter read by sean linet this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. For W. M. L. W. The Little Girl Who Hath a Doll's House Once upon a time there was a very beautiful doll's house. It was red brick and with white windows and it had real muslin curtains, and a front door, and a chimney. It belonged to two dolls, called Lucinda and Jane. At least it belonged to Lucinda, but she never ordered meals. Jane was the cook, but she never did any cooking, because the dinner had been bought ready-made in a box full of shavings. There were two red lobsters, and a ham, a fish, a pudding, and some pears and oranges. They would not come off the plates, but they were extremely beautiful. One morning Lucinda and Jane had gone out for a drive in the doll's perambulator. 
There was no one in the nursery, and it was very quiet. Presently there was a little scuffling, scratching noise in a corner near the fireplace, where there was a hole under the skirting board. Tom Thumb put out his head for a moment, and then popped it in again. Tom Thumb was a mouse. A minute afterwards, Hunkamunka, his wife, put her head out, too, and when she saw that there was no one in the nursery, she ventured out on the oilcloth under the coal box. The doll's house stood at the other side of the fireplace. Tom Thumb and Hunkamunka went cautiously across the hearth rug. They pushed the front door. It was not fast. Tom Thumb and Hunkamunka went upstairs and peeped into the dining room. Then they squeaked with joy. Such a lovely dinner was laid out upon the table. There were tin spoons, and lead knives and forks, and two dolly chairs, all so convenient. Tom Thumb sent to work at once to carve the ham. It was a beautiful shiny yellow streaked with red. The knife crumpled up and hurt him. He put his finger in his mouth. It is not boiled enough. It is hard. You have a try, Hunka Munka. Hunka Munka stood up in her chair and chopped at the ham with another lead knife. It's as hard as the hams at the cheesemongers, said Hunka Munka. The ham broke off the plate with a jerk and rolled onto the table. Let it alone, said Tom Thumb. Give me some fish, Hunka Munka. Hunka Munka tried every tin spoon in turn. The fish was glued to the dish. Then Tom Thumb lost his temper. He put the ham in the middle of the floor and hit it with the tongs and with a shovel. Bang, bang, smash, smash! The ham flew all into pieces, for underneath the shiny paint it was made of nothing but plaster. Then there was no end to the rage and disappointment of Tom Thumb and Hunka Munka. They broke up the pudding, the lobsters, the pears, and the oranges. As the fish would not come off the plate, they put it into the red-hot, crinkly paper fire in the kitchen. But it would not burn, either. Tom Thumb went up the kitchen chimney and looked out at the top. There was no soot. While Tom Thumb was up the chimney, Hunka Munka had another disappointment. She found some tiny canisters upon the dresser, labelled Rice, Coffee, Sago. But when she turned them upside down, there was nothing inside except red and blue beads. Then those mice set to work to do all the mischief they could, especially Tom Thumb. He took Jane's clothes out of the chest of drawers in her bedroom, and he threw them out of the top floor window. But Hunka Munka had a frugal mind. After pulling half the feathers out of Lucinda's bolster, she remembered that she herself was in want of a feather bed. With Tom Thumb's assistance, she carried the bolster downstairs and across the hearth rug. It was difficult to squeeze the bolster into the mouse hole, but they managed it somehow. When Hunka Munka went back and fetched the chair, a bookcase, a bird cage, and several small odds and ends, the bookcase and the bird cage refused to go into the mouse hole. Hunka Munka left them behind the coal box and went to fetch a cradle. Hunka Munka just returning with another chair when suddenly there was a noise of talking outside upon the landing. The mice rushed back to their hole, and the dolls came into the nursery. What a sight met the eyes of Jane and Lucinda! Lucinda sat upon the upset kitchen stove and stared, and Jane leant against the kitchen dresser and smiled. But neither of them made any remark. The bookcase and the bird cage were rescued from under the coal box, but Hunkamunka got the cradle and some of Lucinda's clothes. She also has some useful pots and pans and several other things. The little girl that the doll's house belonged to said, I will get a doll dressed like a policeman. But the nurse said, 
I will set a mouse trap. So that is the story of the two bad mice. But they were not so very, very naughty after all, because Tom Thumb paid for everything he broke. He found a crooked sixpence under the hearth rug, and upon Christmas Eve he and Hunkamunka stuffed it into one of the stockings of Lucinda and Jane. And very early every morning, before anybody is awake, Hunkamunka comes with a dustpan and a broom to sweep the dolly's house. End of the Tale of Two Bad Mice by Beatrix Porter Read by Sean Linet, July 7, 2011Denslow's Mother Goose. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Being the old familiar rhymes and jingles of Mother Goose, edited and illustrated by W. W. Denslow. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men cannot put Humpty Dumpty together again. Mistress Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With cockle shells and silver bells and pretty maids all in a row. By baby bunting, daddy's gone a-hunting. He'll never get this rabbit skin to wrap the baby bunting in. Little Jack Horner sat in the corner, eating a Christmas pie. He put in his thumb, and he took out a plum, and said, What a good boy am I! Old King Cole was a merry old soul, and a merry old soul was he. He called for his pipe, and he called for his bowl, and he called for his fiddlers three. Every fiddler he had a fiddle, and a very fine fiddle had he. Twee twiddle-dee twiddle-dee went the fiddlers. Oh, there's none so rare as can compare with King Cole and his fiddlers three. Ba ba black sheep, have you any wool? Yes, Mary, have I three bags full, one for my master and one for my dame, and one for the little boy who lives in the lane. Pat a cake, pat a cake, baker's man, so I will, master, as fast as I can. Pat it and prick it and mark it with tea, and put it in the oven for Tommy and me. Great A, little A, bouncing B. The cat's in the cupboard, and she can't see. To market, to market, to buy a fat pig. Home again, home again, dancing a jig. Ride to market to buy a fat hog. Home again, home again, jiggity jog. I love little pussy, her coat is so warm. And if I don't hurt her, she'll do me no harm. I'll sit by the fire and give her some food, and pussy will love me because I am good. Higglepee, Picklepee, my black hen, she lays eggs for gentlemen, sometimes nine and sometimes ten. Higglepee, Bigglepee, my black hen. Hickety dickety dock, the mouse ran up the clock, the clock struck one, down the mouse ran, hickety dickety dock. Hushabye, baby, on the treetop, when the wind blows, the cradle will rock, when the bough bends, it never can fall. Safe as the baby, bow, cradle, and all. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children she didn't know what to do. She gave them some broth with plenty of bread. She kissed them all fondly and sent them to bed. Poor old Robinson Crusoe, poor old Robinson Crusoe. They made him a coat of an old nanny goat. I wonder how they could do so. With a ring-a-ting tang and a ring-a-ting tang, poor old Robinson Crusoe. Rain, rain, go away. Come again another day. Little Arthur wants to play. The rose is red, the violet's blue. Sugar is sweet, and so are you. Little boy blue, come blow up your horn. The sheep's in the meadow, the cow's in the corn. There was an old woman tossed up in a blanket nineteen times as high as the moon. Where she was going I couldn't but ask it, for in her hand she carried a broom. Old woman, old woman, old woman, quote I, a whither, a whither, a whither so high, to brush the cobwebs off the sky. Shall I go with thee? Aye, by and by. 
ride a cock horse to banbury cross to see an old lady upon a white horse rings on her fingers and bells on her toes and so she makes music wherever she goes the queen of hearts she made some tarts all on a summer's day the knave of hearts he stole the tarts and took them clean away the king of hearts called for the tarts and beat the knave full sore the knave of hearts brought back the tarts and vowed he'd steal no more little bo peep has lost her sheep and can't tell where to find them leave them alone and they'll come home and bring their tails behind them the north wind doth blow and we shall have snow and what will poor robin do then poor thing he'll sit in a barn and to keep himself warm will hide his head under his wing poor thing there was an old woman and what do you think she lived upon nothing but victuals and drink victuals and drink were the chief of her diet and yet this old woman could never be quiet simple simon met a pieman going to the fair says simple simon to the pieman let me taste your ware says the pieman to simple simon show me first your penny says simple simon to the pieman indeed i have not any simple simon went a-fishing for to catch a whale all the water he had got was in his mother's pail little miss muffet sat on a tuppet there came a great spider who sat down beside her and frightened miss muffet away little tom tucker sings for his supper what shall he eat white bread and butter mary had a little lamb its fleece was white as snow and everywhere that mary went the lamb was sure to go he followed her to school one day that was against the rule it made the children laugh and play to see a lamb at school and so the teacher turned him out but still he lingered near and waited patiently about till mary did appear what makes the lamb love mary so the eager children cry oh mary love is the lamb you know the teacher did reply a diller a dollar a ten o'clock scholar what makes you come so soon you used to come at ten o'clock but now you come at noon i had a little hobby horse and it was dapple gray its head was made of pea straw its tail was made of hay I sold it to an old woman for a copper groat, and I'll not sing my song again without a new coat. Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater, had a wife and couldn't keep her. He put her in a pumpkin shell, and there he kept her very well. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. The man in the moon came down too soon to inquire his way to norwich he went by the south and burnt his mouth with eating cold piece porridge hey diddle diddle the cat and the fiddle the cow jumped over the moon the little dog laughed to see such sport and the dish ran after the spoon there was a fat man of bombay who was smoking one sunshiny day when a bird called a snipe flew away with his pipe which vexed the fat man of bombay hark hark the dogs do bark beggars are coming to town some in tags some in rags and some in velvet gowns jack be nimble jack be quick and jack jump over the candlestick three wise men of gotham went to sea in a bowl and if the bowl had been stronger my song would have been longer deedle deedle dumpling my son john went to bed with his trousers on one shoe off the other shoe on deedle deedle dumpling my son john cock-a-doodle doo my dame has lost her shoe my master's lost his fiddlestick and knows not what to do polly put the kettle on polly put the kettle on polly put the kettle on and let's drink tea Suki, take it off again Suki, take it off again Suki, take it off again they've all gone away end of denslow's mother goose the circus procession by unknown this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org open the gates and draw the curtain here comes something fine that's certain 
louder the band begins to play, open the gates and clear the way. Enters a queen with a king beside her. Every horse is proud of his rider. Two by two they march to the tune, and head the procession that will follow soon. Men in livery, in their places, make the gay steeds keep their paces, soothing down their wildest fears at the rising shouts and cheers. Jocko, in these sports a sharer, acts the part of a standard-bearer, while behind him soldiers gay bugle notes of victory play. Now a clown in line appearing, with a tandem swells the cheering, standing on his horse's back, thus he guides them round the track. On a donkey rides another, quite as funny as his brother, blowing bugle notes so loud, he astonishes the crowd. Here's another clown arriving, in a chariot he is driving, like a noble Roman dressed, lo, he guides three steeds abreast. Nimble little monkey Tony rides along upon a pony, followed by a stupid clown who thinks the rain is pouring down. Here's a creature young and slender, dressed in robes of dazzling splendor. In a chariot decked with gold, she's the fairy queen, I'm told. Close behind her two enormous, elephants first-rate performers, stalk along with heavy tread, sending on their trunks ahead. Here is something very funny, surely worth the entrance money. At the sight what laughter peals! Tis an elephant on wheels. Close behind him a relation, in a state of perspiration, dons his specs and wheels his fan, just like any gentleman. Here is Jumbo, gentle creature, kindness shown in every feature. On his back the children are, safe as in a jaunting car. Shetland ponies, small and stocky, each one mounted by a jockey, marks twixt elephants and giraffes, tis no wonder Towser laughs. Hark! The trumpet loudly pealing knocks the plaster from the ceiling, as there marches on the course the jumbos of the police force. Clowns and dogs, with queer expression, have their place in this procession, and tis hard for dogs I know on their two hind legs to go. Who are these with courtly manners, bearing lofty poles and banners? Faithfully they represent followers of the tournament. Next a line of pretty pages, our attention close engages, the Chinese giant in the rear, making them like dwarfs appear. Here's a funny turnout, surely, with an ostrich last securely, to a coach Zenobia shares, and well the bird the burden bears. Goats upon the mountains ramble, and in harness sometimes amble, but a tandem team like this is a sight you should not miss. Through the desert camels travel, speeding o'er the sand and gravel, bearing heavy burdens too, which in our land they could not do. Here the roads are rough and stony, and the camels back so bony, none but clowns would dare to go on them with the circus show. Goodness gracious, did you ever? Here are harnessed up quite clever two giraffes, the whip they heed, nor venture at a breakneck speed. A soldier comes, on stilts he's stalking. Back of him a dude is walking. Either side of him a friend, as you can see, and that's the end. End of the Circus Procession Wakiwa's Eagle by James Buckham. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Wakiwa's Eagle by James Buckham. One day, when the Indian boy Wakiwa 
was hunting along the mountainside. He found a young eagle with a broken wing, lying at the base of a cliff. The bird had fallen from an airy on a ledge high above, and being too young to fly, had fluttered down the cliff and injured itself so severely that it was likely to die. When Wakiwa saw it, he was about to drive one of his sharp arrows through its body, for the passion of the hunter was strong in him, and the eagle plunders many a fine fish from the Indian's drying frame. But a gentler impulse came to him as he saw the young bird quivering with pain and fright at his feet, and he slowly unbent his bow, put the arrow in his quiver, and stooped over the panting eaglet. For fully a minute the wild eyes of the wounded bird and the eyes of the Indian boy, growing gentler and softer as he gazed, looked into one another. Then the struggling and panting of the young eagle ceased. The wild, frightened look passed out of its eyes, and it suffered Wakiwa to pass his hand gently over its ruffled and draggled feathers. The fierce instinct to fight, to defend its threatened life, yielded to the charm of the tenderness and pity expressed in the boy's eyes, and from that moment Wakiwa and the eagle were friends. Wakiwa went slowly home to his father's lodge, bearing the wounded eaglet in his arms. He carried it so gently that the broken wing gave no twinge of pain, and the bird lay perfectly still, never offering to strike with its sharp beak the hands that clasped it. Warming some water over the fire at the lodge, Wakiwa bathed the broken wing of the eagle and bound it up with soft strips of skin. Then he made a nest of ferns and grass inside the lodge, and laid the bird in it. The boy's mother looked on with shining eyes. Her heart was very tender. From girlhood she had loved all the creatures of the woods, and it pleased her to see some of her own gentle spirit waking in the boy. When Wakiwa's father returned from hunting, he would have caught up the young eagle and wrung its neck. But the boy pleaded with him so eagerly, stooping over the captive and defending it with his small hands, that the stern warrior laughed and called him his little squaw heart. Keep it then, he said, and nurse it until it is well. But then you must let it go, for we will not raise up a thief in the lodges. So Wakewa promised that when the eagle's wing was healed and grown so that it could fly, he would carry it forth and give it its freedom. It was a month, or, as the Indians say, a moon, before the young eagle's wing had fully mended, and the bird was old enough and strong enough to fly. And in the meantime, Wakewa cared for it and fed it daily, and the friendship between the boy and the bird grew very strong, but at last the time came when the willing captive must be freed. So Wakiwa carried it far away from the Indian lodges, where none of the young braves might see it hovering and be tempted to shoot their arrows at it, and there he let it go. The young eagle rose toward the sky in great circles, rejoicing in its freedom and its strange new power of flight. But when Wakiwa began to move away from the spot, it came swooping down again, and all day long it followed him through the woods as he hunted. At dusk, when Wakiwa shaped his course for the Indian lodges, the eagle would have accompanied him. But the boy suddenly slipped into a hollow tree and hid, and after a long time the eagle stopped sweeping about in search of him and flew slowly and sadly away. Summer passed, and then winter and spring came again, with its flowers and birds and swarming fish in the lakes and streams. Then it was that all the Indians, old and young, braves and squaws, pushed their light canoes out from ashore, and with spear and hook waged pleasant war against the salmon and the red-spotted trout. After winter's long imprisonment, it was such a joy to toss in the sunshine and the warm wind and catch savory fish to take the place of dried meats and corn. Above the great falls of the Apahoque, the salmon sported in the cool, swinging current, darting under the lee of the rocks and leaping full length in the clear spring air. 
nowhere else were such salmon to be speared as those which lay among the riffles at the head of the apahoki rapids but only the most daring braves ventured to seek them there for the current was strong and should a light canoe once pass the danger point and get caught in the rush of the rapids nothing could save it from going over the roaring falls very early in the morning of a clear april day just as the sun was rising splendidly over the mountains wakiwa launched his canoe a half mile above the rapids of the apahoki and floated downward spear in hand among the salmon riffles he was the only one of the indian lads who dared fish above the falls but he had been there often and never yet had his watchful eye and his strong paddle suffered the current to carry his canoe beyond the danger point. This morning he was alone on the river, having risen long before daylight to be first at the sport. The riffles were full of salmon, big and lusty fellows who glided about the canoe on every side in an endless silver stream. Wakiwa plunged his spear right and left, and tossed one glittering victim after another into the bark canoe. So absorbed in the sport was he that for once he did not notice when the head of the rapids was reached and the canoe began to glide more swiftly among the rocks. But suddenly he looked up, caught his paddle, and dipped it wildly in the swirling water. The canoe swung sidewise, shivered, held its own against the torrent, and then slowly, inch by inch, began to creep upstream toward the shore but suddenly there was a loud cruel snap and the paddle parted in the boy's hands broken just above the blade wakewa gave a cry of despairing agony then he bent to the gunwale of his canoe and with the shattered blade fought desperately against the current but it was useless the racing torrent swept him downward the hungry falls roared tauntingly in his ears then the Indian boy knelt calmly upright in the canoe, facing the mist of the falls, and folded his arms. His young face was stern and lofty. He had lived like a brave hitherto. Now he would die like one. Faster and faster sped the doomed canoe toward the great cataract. The black rocks glided away on either side like phantoms. The roar of the terrible waters became like thunder in the boy's ears, but still he gazed calmly and sternly ahead, facing his fate as a brave Indian should. At last he began to chant the death song, which he had learned from the older braves. In a few moments all would be over, but he would come before the great spirit with a fearless hymn upon his lips. Suddenly a shadow fell across the canoe. Wakiwa lifted his eyes and saw a great eagle hovering over with dangling legs, and a spread of wings that blotted out the sun. Once more the eyes of the Indian boy and the eagle met, and now it was the eagle who was the master. With a glad cry, the Indian boy stood up in his canoe, and the eagle hovered lower. Now the canoe tossed up on that great swelling wave that climbs to the cataract's edge, and the boy lifted his hands and caught the legs of the eagle. The next moment, he looked down into the awful gulf of waters from its very verge. The canoe was snatched from beneath him and plunged down the black wall of the cataract. But he and the struggling eagle were floating outward and downward through the cloud of mist. The cataract roared terribly, like a wild beast robbed of its prey. The spray beat and blinded. The air rushed upward as they fell, but the eagle struggled on with his burden. He fought his way out of the mist and the flying spray. His great wings threshed the air with a whistling sound. Down, down they sank, the boy and the eagle, but ever farther from the precipice of water and the boiling whirlpool below. At length, with a fluttering plunge, the eagle dropped on a sandbar below the whirlpool, and he and the Indian boy lay there a minute, breathless and exhausted. Then the eagle slowly lifted himself, took the air under his free wings, and soared away, while the Indian boy knelt on the sand, with shining eyes, following the great bird, till he had faded into the gray of the cliffs.
End of Wakiwa's Eagle by James Buckham The Bad Child's Book of Beasts by Hilaire Belloc This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Child, do not throw this book about. Refrain from the unholy pleasure of cutting all the pictures out. Preserve it as your chiefest treasure. Child, have you never heard it said that you are heir to all the ages? Why, then your hands were never made to tear these beautiful thick pages. Your little hands were made to take the better things and leave the worse ones. They also may be used to shake the massive paws of elder persons. And when your prayers complete the day, darling, your little tiny hands were also made, I think, to pray for men who lose their fairy lands. Introduction I call you bad, my little child, upon the title page, because a manner rude and wild is common at your age. The moral of this priceless work, if rightly understood, will make you, from a little Turk, unnaturally good. Do not, as evil children do, who on the slightest grounds, will imitate the kangaroo with wild, unmeaning bounds. Do not, as children badly bred, who eat like little hogs, and when they have to go to bed, will whine like puppy dogs, who take their manners from the ape, their habits from the bear, indulge the loud, unseemly jape, and never brush their hair, but so control your actions that your friends may all repeat, this child is dainty as the cat, and as the owl discreet. THE YAK As a friend to the children, commend me the yak, you will find it exactly the thing, it will carry and fetch, you can ride on its back, or lead it about with a string. The Tartar who dwells on the plains of Tibet, a desolate region of snow, has for centuries made it a nursery pet, and surely the Tartar should know. Then tell your papa where the yak can be got, and if he is awfully rich, he will buy you the creature, or else he will not. I cannot be positive which. THE POLAR BEAR the polar bear is unaware of cold that cuts me through. For why he has a coat of hair. I wish I had one, too. The Lion The Lion, the Lion, he dwells in the waste. He has a big head and a very small waist. But his shoulders are stark, and his jaws they are grim. And a good little child will not play with him. The Tiger The Tiger, on the other hand, is kittenish and mild. He makes a pretty playfellow for any little child and mothers of large families who claim to common sense will find a tiger well repay the trouble and expense the dromedary the dromedary is a cheerful bird i cannot say the same about the curd the whale the whale that wanders round the pole is not a table fish you cannot bake or boil him whole nor serve him in a dish but you may cut his blubber up and melt it down for oil and so replace the colza bean, a product of the soil. These facts should all be noted down and ruminated on by every boy in Oxford town who wants to be a don. The Hippopotamus I shoot the hippopotamus with bullets made of platinum, because if I use leaden ones his hide is sure to flatten them. The Dodo The Dodo used to walk around and take the sun and air. The sun yet warms his native ground. The Dodo is not there. The voice which used to squawk and squeak is now forever dumb. Yet may you see his bones and beak all in the museum. The Marmoset The species man and marmoset are intimately linked. The marmoset survives as yet, but men are all extinct. The Camelopard The Camelopard, it is said, by travellers who never lie, he cannot stretch out straight in bed because he is so high. The clouds surround his lofty head. His hornlets touch the sky. How shall I hunt this quadruped? I cannot tell, not I. I'll buy a little parachute. I'll fill it full of arrowroot, and other necessary things, and I will slay this fearful brute, with stones and sticks and guns and slings. THE LEARNED FISH This learned fish has not sufficient brains to go into the water when it rains. THE ELEPHANT when people call this beast to mind, they marvel more and more 
at such a little tail behind so large a trunk before the big baboon the big baboon is found upon the plains of caribou he goes about with nothing on a shocking thing to do but if he dressed respectably and let his whiskers grow how like this big baboon would be to mr so-and-so the rhinoceros rhinoceros your hide looks all undone you do not take my fancy in the least you have a horn where other brutes have none rhinoceros you are an ugly beast the frog be kind and tender to the frog and do not call him names as slimy skin or pollywog or likewise ugly james or gap a grin or toad gone wrong or bill bandy knees the frog is justly sensitive to epithets like these no animal will more repay a treatment kind and fair at least so lonely people say who keep a frog and by the way they are extremely rare end of the bad child's book of beasts by hilaire belloc more beasts for worse children by hilaire belloc this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. Introduction The parents of the learned child, his father and his mother, were utterly aghast to note the facts he would at random quote of creatures curious, rare, and wild, and wondering, asked each other, An idle little child like this, how is it that he knows? What years of close analysis are powerless to disclose? Our brains are trained, our books are big, and yet we always fail to answer why the guinea pig is born without a tail. Or why the wanderoo should rant in wild, unmeaning rhymes, whereas the Indian elephant will only read the times. Perhaps he found a way to slip unnoticed to the zoo, and gave the pachyderma tip, or pumped the wanderoo or even by an artful plan deceived our watchful eyes and interviewed the pelican who was extremely wise oh no said he in humble tone with shy but conscious look such facts i never could have known but for this little book the python a python i should not advise it needs a doctor for its eyes and has the measles yearly however if you feel inclined to get one to improve your mind and not from fashion merely allow no music near its cage and when it flies into a rage chastise it most severely i had an aunt in yucatan who bought a python from a man and kept it for a pet she died because she never knew these simple little rules and few the snake is living yet the welsh mutton the cambrian welsh or mountain sheep is of the ovine race his conversation is not deep but then observe his face the porcupine what would you slap the porcupine unhappy child desist alas that any friend of mine should turn toptophilist to strike the meanest and the least of creatures is a sin how much more bad to beat a beast with prickles on its skin the scorpion the scorpion is as black as soot he dearly loves to bite he is a most unpleasant brute to find in bed at night the crocodile whatever our faults we can always engage that no fancy or fable shall sully our page so take note of what follows i beg this creature so grand and august in its age in its youth is hatched out of an egg and oft in some far coptic town the missionary sits him down to breakfast by the nile the heart beneath his priestly gown is innocent of guile when suddenly the rigid frown of panic is observed to drown his customary smile why does he start and leap amain and scour the sandy libyan plain like one that wants to catch a train or wrestles with internal pain because he finds his egg contain green hungry horrible and plain an infant crocodile the vulture the vulture eats between his meals and that's the reason why he very very rarely feels as well as you and i his eye is dull, his head is bald, his neck is growing thinner. Oh, what a lesson for us all to only eat at dinner. The bison. The bison is vain, and I write it with pain. The doormat you see on his head is not, as some learned professors maintain, the opulent growth of a genius brain. 
but is sewn on with needle and thread. THE VIPER Yet another great truth I record in my verse, that some vipers are venomous, some the reverse. A fact you may prove, if you try, by procuring two vipers and letting them bite. With the first you are only the worse for a fright, but after the second you die. THE LAMA The llama is a woolly sort of fleecy hairy goat, with an indolent expression and an undulating throat, like an unsuccessful literary man. And I know the place he lives in, or at least I think I do. It is Ecuador, Brazil, or Chile, possibly Peru. You must find it in the atlas if you can. The llama of the pampasas you never should confound, in spite of a deceptive similarity of sound, with the llama who is lord of Turkestan. For the former is a beautiful and valuable beast, but the latter is not lovable nor useful in the least. And the ruminant is preferable surely to the priest, who battens on the woeful superstitions of the East, the Mongol of the monastery of Shan. THE CHAMOIS The chamois inhabits Lucerne, where his habits, though why I have not any idea, give him sudden short spasms on the brink of deep chasms, and he lives in perpetual fear. THE FROZEN MAMMOTH This creature, though rare, is still found to the east of the northern Siberian zone. It is known to the whole of that primitive group that the carcass will furnish an excellent soup, though the cooking it offers one drawback, at least, of the serious nature I own. If the skin be but punctured before it is boiled, your confection is wholly and utterly spoiled, and hence, on account of the size of the beast, the dainty is nearly unknown. THE MICROBE The microbe is so very small you cannot make him out at all, but many sanguine people hope to see him through a microscope. His jointed tongue that lies beneath a hundred curious rows of teeth, his seven tufted tails with lots of lovely pink and purple spots, on each of which a pattern stands, composed of forty separate bands, his eyebrows of a tender green, all these have never yet been seen, but scientists who ought to know assure us that they must be so. Oh, let us never, never doubt what nobody is sure about. End of More Beasts for Worse Children by Hilaire Belloc Mother West Wind Howe Stories How Old Mr. Crow Lost His Double Tongue by Thornton W. Burgess This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Caw! 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 Blacky the Crow sat in the top of a tall tree and seemed trying to see just how much noise he could make with that harsh voice of his. Peter Rabbit peered out from the dear old briar patch and frowned. If I had a voice as unpleasant as that, I'd forget I could talk. Yes, sir, I'd forget I had a tongue, declared Peter. Somebody laughed, and Peter turned quickly to find Jimmy Skunk. What are you laughing at? demanded Peter. At the idea of you forgetting that you had a tongue, replied Jimmy. Well, I would if I had a voice like Blackie's, persisted Peter although he grinned a wee bit foolishly as he looked at Jimmy Skunk, for you know Peter is a great gossip. "'It's lucky for you that you haven't, then,' retorted Jimmy. "'I'm afraid that you would lose your tongue just as old Mr. Crow did.' That sounded like a story. Right away Peter sat up and took notice. "'Did old Mr. Crow really lose his tongue? How did he lose it? Why did he lose it? When?' Jimmy Skunk clapped a hand over each ear and pretended that he was going to run away. Peter jumped in front of him. No, you don't, he cried. You've just got to tell me that story, Jimmy Skunk. What story? asked Jimmy, as if he hadn't the least idea in the world what Peter was talking about, though of course he knew perfectly well. Caw! 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 shouted Blackie the Crow from the distant treetop. THE STORY OF HOW OLD MR. CROW LOST HIS TONGUE. YOU MAY AS WELL TELL ME FIRST AS LAST, BECAUSE I'LL GIVE YOU NO PEACE UNTIL YOU DO, INSISTED PETER. JIMMY GRINNED. IF THAT'S THE CASE, 
I guess I'll have to, said he. Wait until I find a comfortable place to sit down. I never could tell a story standing up. At last he found a place to suit him, and after changing his position two or three times to make sure that he was perfectly comfortable, he began. Once upon a time... Never mind about that, interrupted Peter. I don't see why all stories have to begin once upon a time. It seems as if everything interesting happened long ago. If you don't watch out, this story won't begin at all, declared Jimmy. Peter looked properly ashamed for interrupting, and Jimmy started again. Once upon a time, old Mr. Crow, the great, great, ever so great grandfather of Blackie over there, possessed the most wonderful tongue of any of the little people who ran, walked, crawled, or flew. He could imitate any and everybody, and he did. He could sing like Mr. Meadowlark, or he could bark like Mr. Wolf. He could whistle like Mr. Quail, or he could growl like Old King Bear. There wasn't anybody whose voice he couldn't imitate and do it so well that if you had been there and heard but not seen him, you never would have guessed that it was an imitation. Now, the imp of mischief was in old Mr. Crow, just as it is in Blackie today, and he was smart, too. There wasn't anybody smarter than old Mr. Crow. It's from him that Blackie gets his smartness. It didn't take him long to discover that no one else had such a wonderful tongue. It was even more wonderful than the tongue of old Mr. Mocker the Mockingbird. Mr. Mocker could imitate the songs of other birds, but old Mr. Crow could imitate anybody, as I have said. He puzzled over it a good deal himself for a while. He couldn't understand how he could make any sound he pleased, while his neighbors could make only a few special sounds. Being very smart and shrewd, just as black he is, he finally made up his mind that it must be in his tongue. As soon as he thought of that, he started out to find out, and on one excuse or another, he managed to get all his neighbors to show him their tongues. Sure enough, his own tongue was different from any of the others. It was split a little, so that it was almost like two tongues in one. That's it, he chuckled. I knew it. It's this little old tongue of mine. Nobody else has got one like it, but nobody knows that but me. I must make good use of it. Yes, sir, I must make good use of it. Now, when old Mr. Crow said that, he didn't really mean good use at all. That is, he didn't mean what you or I or any of his neighbors would have called good use. What he did mean was the use that would bring to himself the greatest gain and pleasure, and being a great joker, he began by having a lot of fun with his neighbors. When he saw Mr. Rabbit, your grandfather a thousand times removed, coming along, he would hide, and just as Mr. Rabbit was passing, he would snarl like Mr. Lynx. Of course, Mr. Rabbit would be scared almost to death, and away he would go, lipperty-lipperty-lip, and old Mr. Crow would laugh so that he had to hold his black sides. He would hide in the top of a tree near Mr. Squirrel's home, and just when Mr. Squirrel had found a fat nut and started to eat it, he would scream like Mr. Hawk, and then laugh to see Mr. Squirrel drop his nut and dive head first into the nearest hole. He would squeak like a mouse when Mr. Fox was passing, just to see Mr. Fox hunt and hunt for the dinner he felt sure was close at hand. But after a while, Mr. Crow wasn't satisfied with harmless jokes. Times were getting hard, and everybody had to work to get enough to eat. This didn't suit Mr. Crow at all, and one day, when he chanced to discover one of his neighbors just sitting down to a good meal, a new idea came to him. He stole as near as he could without being seen, and suddenly growled like old King Bear. Of course, that meal was left in a hurry. It is too bad to see all that good food go to waste, said Mr. Crow, and promptly ate it. After that, instead of hunting for food himself, he just kept a sharp eye on his neighbors, and when they had found something he wanted, he frightened them away and helped himself. 
all the time he was so sly about it that never once was he suspected. He was a great talker, was Mr. Crow, and spent a great deal of time gossiping, and he was always one of the first to offer sympathy to those who had lost a meal. Now all this time, unknown to old Mr. Crow, old Mother Nature knew just what was going on, for you can't fool her, and it's of no use to try. One morning, Mr. Crow discovered Mr. Coon just sitting down to a good breakfast. He stole up behind Mr. Coon and opened his mouth to bark like Mr. Coyote. But instead of a bark, there came forth a harsh, Gaw! 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 It is a question which was the more surprised, Mr. Coon or Mr. Crow. Mr. Coon didn't forget his manners. He politely invited Mr. Crow to sit down and take breakfast with him. But Mr. Crow had lost his appetite. Somehow his tongue felt very queer. He thanked Mr. Coon and begged to be excused. Then he hurried over to the nearest pool of water in which he could see his reflection and stuck out his tongue. It was no longer split into a double tongue. Then old Mr. Crow guessed that old Mother Nature had found him out and punished him. But to make sure, he flew to the most lonesome place he knew of, and there he tried to imitate the voices of his neighbors. But try as he would, all he could say was, Caw! 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 For a long, long time after that, no one ever heard Mr. Crow say a word. His neighbors didn't know what to make of it, for you remember he had been a great gossip. They said that he must have lost his tongue. Of course he hadn't, but he felt that he might as well have. And ever since then, the Crow family has had the harshest of all voices. Caw! 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 shouted Blackie from the top of the tree where he was sitting. I wonder, said Peter thoughtfully, if he could imitate other people if his tongue should be split. I've heard say that he could, replied Jimmy Skunk, but I don't know. One thing is sure, and that is that he is just as smart and sly as his great, great, ever so great grandfather was, and I guess it is just as well that his tongue is just as it is. End of Mother West Wind Howe Stories how Old Mr. Crow Lost His Double Tongue Read by Antoinette Griffin www.storieswithantoinette.com King Winter by an Unknown Author This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The sky is dull and gray, piercing and chill the blast. Each step resounds on the frosty ground. Winter is come at last. Mama sits by the fire, her little ones round her knees. How cozy we are, Mama, they cry. Tell us something, if you please. Tell us about King Winter, and about Jack Frost, his man. We'll not be noisy or naughty at all but as good as ever we can. Well, then, says Mama, you, Jenny, may knit and listen, my dear, and Johnny may split up wood to make the fire burn bright and clear. King Winter dwells in the north, far away in the frozen zone. In a palace of snow he holds his court and sits on an icy throne. He has cushions, of course. His queen made them out of her wedding gown stuffing them well with snowflakes fine and soft as eider down. The king has a trusty servant. Jack Frost is his name. His nose is raspberry red, his beard is white, and stiff as a crutch it grows. Old Jack is a sturdy good fellow and serves their majesties well. He's here and he's there and he's everywhere and does more than I can tell. 
Each year, as the day comes round, the king and his royal train set off on a tour through the wide, wide world and sweep over mountain and plain. His majesty fails not to visit every clime that's not too hot, to look in upon both high and low, from the palace down to the cot. Jack Frost has a busy time then, but he's helped and advised by the queen that all may be right when the king goes forth and everything's fit to be seen. That the king may have a pleasant travel and no stone hurt his royal toe, her majesty spreads all over the earth a carpet of downy snow. Fine mirrors the king delights in, none are finer than Jack can make, and in matchless sheets of crystal clear he lays them on river and lake. The trees, all naked and drear, he robes in the purest white, and with icicles shining with rainbow hues he makes their branches bright. And for want of buds and blossoms to strew in his majesty's way, with magic flowers of his own device he makes the windows gay. These wonders wrought in a single night may well excite surprise. Amazed is the sun when he gets up at dawn, and he stares with all his eyes. Then out come all the boys and girls, Jack's handiwork to view, and their noses and cheeks turn red with cold, some of them even turn blue. They pelt each other with snow, roll it up in a mighty ball, and shout and laugh and scamper about, and heels over head they fall. They make a huge man of snow, as grand as a Russian czar, a wooden sword in his hand, in his mouth a carrot to serve for cigar. His eyes, his hair, and his beard, they paint as black as my shoe with burnt stick, but they spoil his nose, for they stick it rather askew. Then what do you think? For a cock-shot they take him, they pelt him and hit, they knock off the snowman's ears and nose, but he does not mind it a bit. Hurrah for the good thick ice! Oh, isn't it jolly? They slide, they skate, and in sleighs so fine they go, and swift as the wind they glide. King Winter laughs at the sport, cries bravo, and claps his hands, and, calling in haste for his man, Jack Frost, he gives him these commands. Go see the papas and mamas, and bring me word what they say. Have the children been good and well behaved, since last I came this way? The king trims Christmas trees to give to good boys and girls, with tapers and trinkets of silver and gold, and all sorts of dainties and toys. The queen cuts twigs of birch, of birch so supple and keen, and daintily ties them up into rods, the finest that ever were seen. Soon, with this word to the king, Jack Frost comes back at a trot. Good have most of the children been, but some of them have not. The king gives him the pretty trees, the queen the rods so smart, and away goes Jack again with his load, till every house has its part. Cakes, mince pies, nuts, and apples good children get from the king. You can guess what the naughty get. The rods are the only thing. Oh, dear mamma! cries Jenny. Johnny's been good, and so have I. Pray tell Jack Frost we don't want the rod. Oh, do ask him to put it by. Mama smiles on her darlings. They run to her, kiss her, and say, How long do you think will it be, Mama, ere King Winter goes away? He will lay upon baby's cradle the snowdrops that early come forth, and then, my dears, he will bid us good-bye and go back to his home in the north. End of King Winter Animal Children by Edith Brown Kirkwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sometimes I am so sorry that my papa is a king. It's really most annoying and hurts like everything. 
to have the little girls and boys all want to run away, for if I am a lion prince I'm a baby anyway. Some jungle boys, by mischief made quite bold, once took the baby tiger, so we're told, and in broad stripes they smeared his coat so fine, and round his neck they hung a fresh paint sign. This monkey thought the leopard's spots were pasted on for polka dots. He asked her how much it would cost, new ones to buy, if those were lost. In her red and white gown, Miss Weasel's so pert, we are very afraid she's a gay little flirt. She is fearful of no one, beast, reptile, or man, just winks and cries gaily, Catch me if you can. This dapper young chappy is dude Ocelot, with coat trimmed in many a dash and a spot. He's graceful and elegant, sly, too, as well. Just what he'll do next no one ever can tell. The cheetah is a great big cat, but very quick for all of that. She's cunning, but she's gentle, too, and if you're good, she's good to you. The little bobcat and Canadian lynx just must be related, so everyone thinks. Except for their ears they are alike as two pins, and look every whit as if they were twins. A dainty, fastidious man is Lord Otter, who can live just as well on land as in water. He'll eat but the flakiest part of a fish, and this he considers his favorite dish. It really is a bother to be sought by every one, the vain young ermine boasted, why it keeps me on the run. To get away from kings and queens and peers and ladies great, it truly gets me all fussed up and in a dreadful state. Young Ferret, detective, said, I'll show you where to track the bold rabbit right into his lair. Then he never saw Bunny right under his eyes, but went swaggering off looking wondrously wise. Now, Johnny, my child, said wise Mama Sable, when you see a trap run as fast as you're able, or else, ere you know it, your skin will be gone as a beautiful fur for some lady to don. Mother Opossum says she'd like to ask just why other mothers should find it a task to care for one baby. Why, here she has four, and there's plenty of room on her tail for some more. Mr. and Mrs. Mongoose are popular as can be, the reason being very plain, as you will all agree. They are cunning and affectionate and clean and very nice. They kill all snakes and insects and naughty rats and mice. It must be very easy for the busy beaver mother to feed the beaver sister and her little beaver brother, for when they beg, We're hungry, give us something to eat, please, she sends them off to nibble at the bark of the big trees. The puma is a bandit who'll not meet you face to face, but waits to spring upon you from some well-hidden place. He'll strike you when your back is turned, but away he's sure to fly, if you should turn to look at him right squarely in the eye. Lemur stays in bed all day, and waits until the night to play. That's why his soft feet make no sound, and why his eyes are big and round. The bowery boy of the woods is young Mink. His coat is so lovely one never would think that he'd do naughty things, but we've often been told he is tricky and wicked and saucy and bold. I'm not so very big around, and not great as to length, but one thing peccaries have learned, in numbers there is strength. Now if you do not bother me, I will not bother you, but all my friends and family will help me if you do. Who is this boy in clothes so neat, young Springbok, Africa's athlete? He lives up in the mountains tall, and as a jumper beats them all. The long-eared bat and the flying fox and the flying squirrel, too, decided to give an arrow meat just to show what they could do. So they formed a club and went around and invited every one. Then up they flew and did their stunts and had a lot of fun. 
she is dainty as snowdrops that fall from the skies is this dear little kitten with bright shiny eyes and velvety ears and pretty pink nose and lovely white suit of soft furry clothes baby raccoon takes all his food and goes straight to the pool he eats not one small bite of it until it's wet and cool now although you may think this strange and stop to wonder why he no doubt thinks it just as queer for you to like yours dry the greatest of travelers that one can meet is the little deer mouse with the pretty white feet north south east or west she will go at her will and never no never is known to keep still the baby zebra ne'er should roam so very far away from home lest someone thinking her striped gown was candy stick might eat her down i'm stopping for a moment just to say how do you do i've just been decorated with this ribbon of deep blue because of all the gracefulness with which i trot and prance no wonder that you give sir horse your most admiring glance this tale is not so very new and no doubt has been told to you but donkey went to school to play and now he sits dressed up this way here is the only baby who never makes a noise which must be very puzzling to little girls and boys yet the giraffe is happy though he cannot shout or sing for with that great long neck of his he can reach anything the taper feeds on leaves and fruit he's very very hard to suit for boys who don't like bread and meat have to find other things to eat he has climbed to the top of a rocky throne to look down on a land once so proudly his own his people are scattered he has no place to go he is weary and sad poor king buffalo lemonade lemonade the bold monkey cried it's only five cents and it's cooling beside miss camel just sniffed and tossed high her head i drink only every nine days sir she said milk or meat or leather for shoes almost anything that we choose we'll find the good cow gives with joy to every nice little girl and boy i wonder where the names come from i'm sure that you do too for instance there's the animal that has been called the new his race is just as strange too for no one seems to know just what he is an antelope horse bull or buffalo big moose came boldly from behind the tall trees and said in loud voice who called if you please i'm ready to meet any one who says fight but we'll come in the open and do the thing right i'm not sure i'd care to meet this big horn goat upon the street not when his eyes and smile and air just seem to shout come if you dare brave soldier ibex stalks before the mountain fortress high and watches eagerly to note a stranger passing by who's there he calls and to his friends he whistles the alarm and off they go to mountain tops where they are safe from harm the chamois lives in the mountains high he's ever and ever and ever so spry he leaps and he plays with never a fall i'm sure that you never could do that at all billy goat and nanny goat went out one day to tea they promised mother goat they'd be good as they could be but on the way they passed some goats who cried oh see the dude and then they had to go back home for billy got real rude her coat is soft as velvet of a lovely yellow brown with a bit of fawn for trimming and a lining white as down her eyes are large and kindly she is gentle too as well you would love a little playmate as sweet as miss gazelle a sturdy young american is rocky mountain goat with big strong horns upon his head and shaggy furry coat he loves to scramble over rocks or leap a mountain brook and should you chase him he will fly into his hidden nook 
We reindeer come straight from your own Santa Claus. In our gallop of joy we never will pause. We eat from the mountain tops, drink from the dells, and use for our skipping ropes merry sleigh bells. A large and handsome personage is the most noble yak. His mantle is a fringe of hair that drapes his sides and back. He's very, very grand indeed when he stands up, you see. In fact, he's just as noble as a noble ought to be. When young Mrs. Kangaroo goes for a hop, to call or to market or perhaps out to shop, she has no nice carriage where baby can ride, so he creeps in a pocket that hangs at her side. He does not care when the sleet comes down or the chilly wind blows strong, for he wears a hat that is made of horn and a fur coat warm and long. He never gets frost-bitten toes, though in snow and ice he plays. Now being a musk-ox can't be bad in the long cold winter days. The very best I have, sir, fine and a whole yard wide. It wears and has no bother of a right and wrong side. I'm sure she'd like a dress of it. It will not spot or pull. Then Miss Alpaca added, I know it's my own wool. This dear little sheep has lost Bo Peep. She wandered away as he lay asleep. He has found her bonnet and shepherd's crook, but for little Bo Peep in vain does he look. Young Miss Rhinoceros gave a beach party. She greeted her friends with a welcome most hearty. They laughed and they joked and they swam in the sea, and the party was gay as a party should be. She comes from Spain, this proud, proud dame. Mistress Merino is her name. Her wool weaves into dress goods rare. Her skin makes gloves the ladies wear. Merry guinea pigs one day went out in the fields to play. Daisy smiled and wished that they would never, never go away. Here is a sister piggy and a brother piggy too. The story they are telling here would not apply to you, for selfish little sisters who make their brothers cry do not belong in houses but with piggies in the sty. Now here's a little lady who seems a wee bit shy, or is it that a teardrop is trembling in her eye? Well, I am sure that you or I would make an awful fuss if we should have to have her name Miss Hippopotamus. In animal land, as everywhere, there lives a Mr. Boar, who never is contented unless he holds the floor. His fellows all may frown at him, but he cannot refrain from pushing into everything. He's so selfish and so vain. Mother and father and little Miss Bear went out for a walk and a bit of fresh air, not through the dark woods, the old tale to repeat but in their best clothes right down the front street. When little Miss Polar Bear goes out to skate, she never is bothered by having to wait until Mother wraps her all snugly in fur, for those are the clothes that she carries with her. Just look about and see if you can find a friend who's quite as true as this old doggy that you see a smiling here at you and me. I'm just a little puppy, and good as good can be, and why they call me naughty I'm sure I cannot see. I've only carried off one shoe and torn the baby's hat, and chased the ducks and spilled the milk. There's nothing bad in that. The mandrill looks so very queer. I'm glad he lives way off from here. He's purple, blue, red, black, and brown. I'm sure he is the jungle clown. The baby gorilla of the family, called Ape, is very like you in size and in shape. But he lives in the jungle with black hair for clothes, and he gets very naughty the older he grows. This cute little brother and sister you see, seated cozily high on the limb of a tree, are the marmoset twins whose appealing round eyes look from flower-like faces in wondering surprise. 
I've climbed up here to smile at you, and oh, what do you think? I've scattered Master's papers and upset all of his ink. But then, if little monkeys were always so very good, they'd not be little monkeys who just can't act as they should. He is so very lazy that he is even loath to walk upon his own feet, this funny boy named Sloth. He swings upon the branches from morning until night, and eats the leaves about him with laziest delight. He works on tunnels night and day, this marmot boy from far away. When winter comes, then in he creeps, and there until the spring he sleeps. The woodchuck resides in a hole in the ground. He is surly and cross, and he never is found out in the bright sunlight unless it's to see if he can't make more winter for you and for me. This naughty boy just eats and eats until he is a sight. He eats until he cannot hold another tiny bite. Of course, he's just an animal. They call him Wolverine. But does he make you think of boys that you have ever seen? Old Mr. Walrus climbs out of the deep for a breath of air and an hour of sleep. You will note that he isn't much on looks, but his skin we make into pocket-books. He sits on the top of a gay wooden stand. He stands on his head, or he shakes your hand. He dances a jig, or he trumps a chant, this jolly old circus elephant. Naughty, naughty squirrel baby, just as mother has you dressed, in your ribbons and your laces and your go-to-meeting best. Then to run and grab an apple and get yourself all must. Are you not afraid that mother will be very, very fussed? To market, to market, with baskets of eggs, Jack Rabbit goes hurrying on his long legs. He'll buy him some colors, red, green, yellow, blue, and when Easter comes round you know what he'll do. Chipmunk is a jolly lad, always friendly, never sad. Shares with friends his wheat grains yellow. He's a genuine good fellow. The Coney lives in Palestine, but he is very seldom seen. You see, he is so small and shy, he hides when folks are passing by. They call this boy the Kowati. His name is strange, and so is he. He laps to drink, digs with his snout. On ground or trees he runs about. The cute little dogs that live on the prairie were having a party and making quite merry. When Big Dog on watch heard a noise and called hush, and into their holes went the guests in a rush. What do you suppose is in Gray Wolf's pack? He carries so stealthily over his back. Some chickens, a lamb, and an old mother hen he has stolen to hide away in his den. His manners are so charming, and his eyes so very bright, I do believe that we might call young Fox a gallant knight. But then, when he is cunning and just a little pert, I'm not so sure but we should call this same young Fox a flirt. We just want to ask if you ever have seen a much dirtier boy than this little hyena. He has played in the street at making mud pies till nothing is clean save the whites of his eyes. Bo Coyote sings a nightly tune to his lady fair in the big round moon. She smiles and throws moonbeams to him, and he serenades till her light is dim. Tommy and Tilly Badger went out in the field to play. Said Tommy, Here, I'll teach you. Put down your head this way. Then toss your heels into the air and give a little twirl. You can't help turning somersaults, although you are a girl. Miss Leopard Spermophilus, with her high-sounding name, says just to be called Gopher is really a shame. But she's right here to tell you, if this knowledge you should lack, she's the only one who wears the stars and stripes upon her back. Doggy barked and said, What fun to make that porcupine girl run! Girls for boys to tease were meant, 
but girls with pens are different. Sir Knight Armadillo, from tail tip to nose, in armor that's sure to bring terror to foes, goes forth with his weapons to his battleground, and looks like a pineapple walking around. Away in Australia the echidna stays. He is noted because of his strange little ways. His claws are so sharp that in manner quite tragic. When frightened he sinks in the ground as by magic. Miss Ant Eater's mouth is so dreadfully small, it scarce seems it could be a real mouth at all. And her long furry tail is her blanket at night. It covers and tucks her in all snug and tight. This queer little mole has a star for a nose, just a shade of the pink in a dew-wet rose. He lives down in the ground where tis always like night, so perhaps his star nose is to twinkle for light. Here we have Mr. Duckbill of no little fame. His mouth, you will see, is what gives him his name. He can walk, swim, or burrow, and, so we have heard, his wife, Mrs. Duckbill, lays eggs like a bird. Such a dainty little person in her coat of pale clear gray is this maiden, Miss Chinchilla, and the hunter folks all say she is so clean, she's exquisite and never dreams of harm, when they go to take her silken fur which helps to keep her warm. The circus fat lady is big Mrs. Whale, with her very large head and her very long tail, and her ears and her eyes almost covered from sight, in the folds of thick skin that wraps her up tight. End of Animal Children The Queen of Quok by L. Frank Baum this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A king once died, as kings are apt to do, being as liable to shortness of breath as other mortals. It was high time this king abandoned his earth life for he had lived in a sadly extravagant manner, and his subjects could spare him without the slightest inconvenience. His father had left him a full treasury, both money and jewels being in abundance. But the foolish king just deceased had squandered every penny in riotous living. He had then taxed his subjects until most of them became paupers, and this money vanished in more riotous living. Next he sold all the grand old furniture in the palace, all the silver and gold plate and bric-a-brac, all the rich carpets and furnishings, and even his own kingly wardrobe, reserving only a soiled and moth-eaten ermine robe to fold over his threadbare raiment. And he spent the money in further riotous living. Don't ask me to explain what riotous living is. I only know, from hearsay, that it is an excellent way to get rid of money. And so this spendthrift king found it. He now picked all the magnificent jewels from his kingly crown, and from the round ball on the top of his scepter, and sold them and spent the money. Right as living, of course. But at last he was at the end of his resources. He couldn't sell the crown itself, because no one but the king had the right to wear it. Neither could he sell the royal palace, because only the king had the right to live there. So finally he found himself reduced to a bare palace, containing only a big mahogany bedstead that he slept in, a small stool on which he sat to pull off his shoes, and the moth-eaten ermine robe. In this strait he was reduced to the necessity of borrowing an occasional dime from his chief counsellor, with which to buy a ham sandwich. And the chief counsellor hadn't many dimes. One who counselled his king so foolishly was likely to ruin his own prospects as well. 
So the king, having nothing more to live for, died suddenly, and left a ten-year-old son to inherit the dismantled kingdom, the moth-eaten robe, and the jewel-stripped crown. No one envied the child, who had scarcely been thought of until he became king himself. Then he was recognized as a personage of some importance, and the politicians and hangers-on, headed by the chief counsellor of the kingdom, held a meeting to determine what could be done for him. These folk had helped the old king to live riotously while his money lasted, and now they were poor and too proud to work, so they tried to think of a plan that would bring more money into the little king's treasury, where it would be handy for them to help themselves. After the meeting was over, the chief counsellor came to the young king, who was playing peg-top in the courtyard, and said, "'Your Majesty, we have thought of a way to restore your kingdom to its former power and magnificence.' "'All right,' replied His Majesty, carelessly. "'How will you do it?' "'By marrying you to a lady of great wealth,' replied the counsellor. "'Marrying me?' cried the king. "'Why, I'm only ten years old!' "'I know. It is to be regretted. But your majesty will grow older, and the affairs of the kingdom demand that you marry a wife.' "'Can't I marry a mother instead?' asked the poor little king, who had lost his mother when a baby. "'Certainly not,' declared the counsellor. "'To marry a mother would be illegal.' To marry a wife is right and proper. "'Can't you marry her yourself?' inquired His Majesty, aiming his peg-top at the chief counsellor's toe, and laughing to see how he jumped to escape it. "'Let me explain,' said the other. "'You haven't a penny in the world, but you have a kingdom. There are many rich women who would be glad to give their wealth in exchange for a queen's coronet even if the king is but a child. So we have decided to advertise that the one who bids the highest shall become the Queen of Quok. "'If I must marry at all,' said the king, after a moment's thought, "'I prefer to marry Nyana, the armorer's daughter.' "'She is too poor,' replied the counsellor. "'Her teeth are pearls, her eyes are amethysts, and her hair is gold.' declared the little king. "'True, your majesty, but consider that your wife's wealth must be used. How would Nyana look after you have pulled her teeth of pearls, plucked out her amethyst eyes, and shaved her golden head?' The boy shuddered. "'Have your own way,' he said despairingly. "'Only let the lady be as dainty as possible, and a good playfellow.' "'We shall do our best,' returned the chief counsellor, and went away to advertise throughout the neighbouring kingdoms for a wife for the boy king of Quok. There were so many applicants for the privilege of marrying the little king that it was decided to put him up at auction, and ordered that the largest possible sum of money should be brought into the kingdom. So, on the day appointed, the ladies gathered at the palace from all the surrounding kingdoms, from Bilkon, Mulgravia, Junkum, and even as far away as the Republic of Macvelt. The chief counsellor came to the palace early in the morning, and had the king's face washed and his hair combed, and then he patted the inside of the crown with old newspapers to make it small enough to fit his majesty's head. It was a sorry-looking crown having many big and little holes in it where the jewels had once been, and it had been neglected and knocked around until it was quite battered and tarnished. Yet, as the counsellor said, it was the king's crown, and it was quite proper he should wear it on the solemn occasion of his auction. Like all boys, be they kings or paupers, his majesty had torn and soiled his one suit of clothes, so that they were hardly presentable, and there was no money to buy new ones. Therefore the counsellor wound the old ermine robe around the king, 
and sat him upon the stool in the middle of the otherwise empty audience chamber. And around him stood all the courtiers and politicians and hangers-on of the kingdom, consisting of such people as were too proud or lazy to work for a living. There was a great number of them, you may be sure, and they made an imposing appearance. Then the doors of the audience chamber were thrown open, and the wealthy ladies who aspired to being Queen of Quok came trooping in. The king looked them over with much anxiety, and decided they were each and all old enough to be his grandmother, and ugly enough to scare away the crows from the royal cornfields, after which he lost interest in them. But the rich ladies never looked at the poor little king squatting upon his stool. They gathered at once about the chief counsellor, who acted as auctioneer. "'How much am I offered for the coronet of the Queen of Quok? asked the counsellor, in a loud voice. "'Where is the coronet?' inquired a fussy old lady, who had just buried her ninth husband, and was worth several millions. "'There isn't any coronet at present,' replied the chief counsellor. "'But whoever bids highest will have the right to wear one, and she can then buy it.' "'Oh,' said the fussy old lady. "'I see.' Then she added, "'I'll bid fourteen dollars.' Fourteen thousand dollars!' cried a sour-looking woman, who was thin and tall, and had wrinkles all over her skin. "'Like a frosted apple,' the king thought. The bidding now became fast and furious, and the poverty-stricken courtiers brightened up as the sum began to mount into the millions. "'He'll bring us a very pretty fortune after all,' whispered one to his comrade and then we shall have the pleasure of helping him spend it." The king began to be anxious. All the women, who looked at all kind-hearted or pleasant, had stopped bidding for lack of money, and the slender old dame with the wrinkles seemed determined to get the coronet at any price, and with it the boy husband. This ancient creature finally became so excited that her wig got crosswise of her head, and her false teeth kept slipping out, which horrified the little king greatly. But she would not give up. At last the chief counsellor ended the auction by crying out, "'Sold to Marianne Brodzinski de la Porcus for three million nine hundred thousand six hundred and twenty-four dollars and sixteen cents. And the sour-looking old woman paid the money in cash and on the spot, which proves this is a fairy story. The king was so disturbed at the thought that he must marry this hideous creature that he began to wail and weep, whereupon the woman boxed his ears soundly. But the counsellor reproved her for punishing her future husband in public, saying, "'You are not married yet. Wait until to-morrow, after the wedding takes place. Then you can abuse him as much as you wish. But at present we prefer to have people think this is a love-match.' The poor king slept but little that night. So filled was he with terror of his future wife nor could he get the idea out of his head that he preferred to marry the armorer's daughter, who was about his own age. He tossed and tumbled around upon his hard bed, until the moonlight came in at the window, and lay like a great white sheet upon the bare floor. Finally, in turning over for the hundredth time, his hand struck against a secret spring in the headboard of the big mahogany bedstead, and at once, with a sharp click, a panel flew open. The noise caused the king to look up, and seeing the open panel, he stood upon tiptoe, and reaching within, drew out a folded paper. It had several leaves fastened together like a book, and upon the first page was written, When the king is in trouble, this leaf he must double, and set it on fire, to obtain his desire. This was not very good poetry, but when the king had spelled it out in the moonlight, he was filled with joy. "'There's no doubt about my being in trouble,' he
he exclaimed. "'So I'll burn it at once, and see what happens.' He tore off the leaf, and put the rest of the book in its secret hiding-place. Then, folding the paper double, he placed it on the top of his stool, lighted a match, and set fire to it. It made a horrid smudge for so small a paper, and the king sat on the edge of the bed and watched it eagerly. When the smoke cleared away, he was surprised to see, sitting upon the stool, a round little man, who with folded arms and crossed legs sat calmly facing the king, and smoking a black briar-wood pipe. "'Well, here I am,' said he. "'So I see,' replied the little king. "'But how did you get here?' "'Didn't you burn the paper?' demanded the round man, by way of answer. "'Yes, I did,' acknowledged the king. "'Then you are in trouble, and I have come to help you out of it. I'm the slave of the royal bedstead.' "'Oh,' said the king, "'I didn't know there was one.' "'Neither did your father, or he would not have been so foolish as to sell everything he had for money. By the way, it's lucky for you he did not sell this bedstead. Now then, what do you want?' "'I'm not sure what I want,' replied the king. "'But I know what I don't want, and that is the old woman who is going to marry me.' "'That's easy enough,' said the slave of the royal bedstead. "'All you need do is to return her the money she paid the chief counsellor, and declare the match off. Don't be afraid. You are the king, and your word is law.' "'To be sure,' said the Majesty. "'But I am in great need of money. How am I going to live if the chief counsellor returns to Marianne Brodzinski her millions?' "'Foo! That's easy enough,' again answered the man, and putting his hand in his pocket, he drew out and tossed to the king an old-fashioned leather purse. "'Keep that with you,' said he, "'and you will always be rich.' for you can take out of the purse as many twenty-five-cent silver pieces as you wish, one at a time. No matter how often you take one out, another will instantly appear in its place within the purse. "'Thank you,' said the king, gratefully. "'You have rendered me a rare favour, for now I shall have money for all my needs, and will not be obliged to marry any one. Thank you a thousand times.' "'Don't mention it,' answered the other, puffing his pipe slowly and watching the smoke curl into the moonlight. "'Such things are easy to me. Is that all you want?' "'All I can think of just now,' returned the king. "'Then please close that secret panel in the bedstead,' said the man. "'The other leaves of the book may be of use to you some time.' The boy stood upon the bed as before, and reaching up, closed the opening so that no one else could discover it. Then he turned to face his visitor, but the slave of the royal bedstead had disappeared. "'I expected that,' said His Majesty. "'Yet I am sorry he did not wait to say good-bye.' With a lightened heart and a sense of great relief, the boy king placed the leathern purse underneath his pillow, and climbing into bed again, slept soundly until morning. When the sun rose, his majesty rose also, refreshed and comforted, and the first thing he did was to send for the chief counsellor. That mighty personage arrived, looking glum and unhappy, but the boy was too full of his own good fortune to notice it. Said he, I have decided not to marry any one, for I have just come into a fortune of my own. Therefore I command you return to that old woman the money she has paid you for the right to wear the coronet of the Queen of Quok, and make public declaration that the wedding will not take place. Hearing this, the counsellor began to tremble, for he saw the young king had decided to reign in earnest, and he looked so guilty that his majesty inquired, "'Well?' 
What is the matter now? Sire, replied the wretch in a shaking voice, I cannot return the woman her money, for I have lost it. Lost it? cried the king, in mingled astonishment and anger. Even so, your majesty. On my way home from the auction last night, I stopped at the drug store to get some potash lozenges for my throat, which was dry and hoarse with so much loud talking, and your majesty will admit it was through my efforts the woman was induced to pay so great a price. Well, going into the drug store, I carelessly left the package of money lying on the seat of my carriage, and when I came out again it was gone, nor was the thief anywhere to be seen. "'Did you call the police?' asked the king. "'Yes, I called, but they were all on the next block, and although they have promised to search for the robber, I have little hope they will ever find him.' The king sighed. "'What shall we do now?' he asked. "'I fear you must marry Marianne Brodzinski, answered the chief counsellor. "'Unless, indeed, you order the executioner to cut her head off.' "'That would be wrong,' declared the king. "'The woman must not be harmed, and it is just that we return her money, for I will not marry her under any circumstances.' "'Is that private fortune you mentioned large enough to repay her?' asked the counsellor. "'Why, yes,' said the king thoughtfully. "'But it will take some time to do it, and that shall be your task. "'Call the woman here.' "'The counsellor went in search of Marianne, "'who, when she heard she was not to become a queen, "'but would receive her money back, "'flew into a violent passion and boxed the chief counsellor's ears "'so viciously that they stung for nearly an hour. "'But she followed him into the king's audience chamber, "'where she demanded her money in a loud voice, claiming as well the interest due upon it overnight. "'The counsellor has lost your money,' said the boy king. "'But he shall pay you every penny out of my own private purse. I fear, however, you will be obliged to take it in small change.' "'That will not matter,' she said, scowling upon the counsellor as she longed to reach his ears again. I don't care how small the change is, so long as I get every penny that belongs to me, and the interest. Where is it? Here, answered the king, handing the counsellor the leathern purse. It is all in silver quarters, and they must be taken from the purse one at a time. But there will be plenty to pay your demands, and to spare. So, there being no chairs, the counsellor sat down upon the floor in one corner, and began counting out silver twenty-five-cent pieces from the purse, one by one. And the old woman sat upon the floor opposite him, and took each piece of money from his hand. It was a large sum, three million nine hundred thousand six hundred and twenty-four dollars and sixteen cents and it takes four times as many twenty-five-cent pieces as it would dollars to make up the amount. The king left them sitting there, and went to school, and often thereafter he came to the counsellor and interrupted him long enough to get from the purse what money he needed to reign in a proper and dignified manner. This somewhat delayed the counting, but as it was a long job anyway that did not matter much. The king grew to manhood, and married the pretty daughter of the armorer, and they now have two lovely children of their own. Once in a while they go into the big audience chamber of the palace, and let the little ones watch the aged, hoary-headed counsellor count out silver twenty-five-cent pieces to a withered old woman, who watched his every movement to see that he does not cheat her. It is a big sum, three million nine hundred thousand six hundred and twenty-four dollars and sixteen cents, in twenty-five-cent pieces. 
but this is how the counsellor was punished for being so careless with the woman's money and this is how marianne brodzinski de la Porgus was also punished for wishing to marry a ten-year-old king in order that she might wear the coronet of the queen of quok end of the queen of quok by l frank baum recording by the story girl